Good morning, Alney. How you doing today? Good. Somebody left 22 cents here. Is that my honorarium? <laughs> <laughs> and now I've got no cents. So. But um, good to see you today. I, I appreciate Pastor Brian asking me once again. Uh, I, I, did, I was uh, wanting to sub, my wife and I were wanting to sub for him to go to Europe and, rather than he, uh, come to preach, but he said, uh, no, no, we're going to do the Europe trip ourselves. <laughs> but I love being with you. It's, it's, it's always a great privilege. I've been here 16 years now as a director of missions, and, uh, and it's, always, it's always a joy to be with you. And uh, my good friend Brian, always good to see him and talk with him. And John, it's good to see, be with John also. Uh, and working with him. I've worked with him before at our annual meeting at the association, and uh, he, your music uh, people always do a good job. Appreciate the praise band that uh, sang at our annual meeting. It's just a, uh, a lot of interaction that we've had uh, lately, and our annual meeting at the Montgomery Baptist Association, too, uh, was very good. Uh, we had our uh, revival three nights along with our annual meeting, and uh, we, we brought in, uh, voted in 10 new churches. That's more than the history of this association ever. And as far as I know, it's, it's, it's uh, more than the history of this whole southern, of, of this state convention, I know. And probably uh, uh, pretty, top, pretty high in the, in the Southern Baptist Convention. Not only that, we've been working with 11 more that are under watch care. So the Lord has blessed with, since last October of last year, about 21 new churches that have been working. It's, it's tremendous, really, uh, how the Lord moves. When the Lord is moving, you just get out of the way and, and try to keep up with what the Lord is doing. Amen. And, and, and it's good to see the growth here and the good spirit. And uh, it's, always, uh, it's always a joy to come and see how the Lord is blessing you. And uh, Pastor Brian and, and I were talking the other day. He, is, uh, he was asking me questions. He's going to be serving on the General Mission Board. Uh, I know someone called me and asked me about who I thought I could recommend, and I recommended Pastor Brian. I thought that he would do a fine job. The General Mission Board, I served on that four years. And... Uh, they work with, uh, basically, they're the group that each association has a representation. We have five, uh, the most of any association. And they have about 50, 52, something like that, from a, a, around the whole state convention. And they get together about every four months. And then they, uh, that, they're the ones that approve the, the ministries and business budget, things like that, uh, to bring it to the annual meeting. So, very important position. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 13 today. have a Jesus with a parable here in, G, in, in a Matthew chapter 13, beginning with verse 24, uh, the, the parable of the tares, it's called, or the weeds. Uh, and, and in many ways, what this is talking about is uh, the evil one, Satan, who goes about through the world and wherever he can, sowing seeds of discord uh, among, uh, wherever he can. He, he, he doesn't want to see good things happen. And, and I guarantee you, whenever good things happen, Satan always wants to try to stop it because it, it's not something that he ever approves of. Uh, Satan does not approve of Christ. He does not approve of the church. He does not approve of anything we do that is good and, and serving God. But we see here in verse 24 of chapter 13, another parable he put forth to them saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field, uh, but while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servants said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares and you also uproot the wheat with them, let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. And then in verse 36, uh, then Jesus sent away the multitude away and went into the house and his disciples came to him saying, explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, he who sows the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, the good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Therefore, as the tares are gathered 
and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all that offend, and all those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has years to hear, uh, let him hear. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word, this parable of Jesus that enlightens us, do enlighten us, and help us to understand it, as only you can guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, we have this coming uh, weekend, one of the most popular holidays, actually, of the year. What is it? Halloween. Halloween. That's right. And uh, someone asked me this morning, are you here to preach against Halloween? Uh, No, that's not my point. Just let you know right now. Uh, but let me explain a little bit about the history of Halloween. It goes way back into ancient times. There was a uh, festival that, uh, that, 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 that in the Celtic nation over in Ireland area, in Ireland, and they had a feast of Samhain. And in this feast and festival, people would light bonfire, bonfires, they would wear costumes, uh, they would uh, ward off the evil spirits. These costumes first of all, was so they would not be recognized by the evil spirits. And, and then also, they could go forth and wear these costumes uh, to, uh, so, that, so that these evil spirits would not recognize them. Now, it was believed at that time that these ghosts that were coming back may be relatives or friends, and uh, they may come back and then it may be evil spirits. So uh, the winter came also. Food supplies got low. Not only would they wear these costumes like this, but there was also a tradition of going out and uh, the poor would gather, would go to door to door and, and, and gather food. Now later on, England called that All Souls Day, where the poor would go forth and they would uh, ask for food and they, they would give it to them. And uh, then also they would sometimes in, in England would put food at the door because there was still this concept of the evil spirits that would come and they would feed the evil spirits so they wouldn't come into their house to get food. Now you start bringing all of this together, and I could go more deeply into this, but on, in the 8th century, Pope Gregory designated November 1st as All Saints Day. And I'm sure Pastor Brian, being a historian, has told you some of this before. Uh, he is the best at history. But here they incorporated some of these traditions of Samhain. The evening before was called All Hallows' Eve. Now, when they had Halloween, when the evil spirits were coming and all that, the Christians saw this as a time where they could oppose the evil spirits. Now, how, how did the modern concepts and customs of Halloween sort of come into being? Well, like a lot of things, they sort of changed and morphed over the centuries. And now uh, there, there's a variety of costumes. And, and some churches even choose to do that, like you're doing the trunk or treat, which is very good, the, the community celebration, children laughing celebration. There, there's nothing wrong with that. And I don't have any problem with, uh, with dressing up. I mean, one year I dressed up like Elvis. <laughs> yeah. Another year I dressed up like Bill Clinton. <laughs> that was funny. And you just never know. And it's kind of fun. But somewhere along the way, how did the concept of evil and uh, gore and this gruesomeness get into this? Anton LaVey, actually, in the 20th century, formed the Church of Satan in the mid-20th century, and he stipulated and, and he set aside Halloween as a satanic day. This was not, not Christians that did this. Now, once again... All of this kind of gets cloudy and mixed together. What I want to center on here is look how this has progressed to where one person starting a satanic religion our minds on Satan and off the good things. That's what I want to talk about today. So many good things that happen in Christianity and in life, Satan wants to come in there and change it or destroy it or make it gruesome or bad. So there are five points I want to share with you that come from this text. And the first point is this. The enemy is the devil. The enemy is no one else. 
even people we disagree with or even people who harm us, what's behind that is Satan. Because I, I'm talking today about uh, not just the devil, the Satan of the Old Testament, not just the Satan that Jesus faced on the temptation on the mount, but the devil in the modern world. Now there are those that would say that evil does not exist. There are those who say that Satan does not exist. And in turn, they can say God does not exist. But the enemy, is very clear, is a dark, evil, intelligent power. The, the, the evil one is not stupid. The Bible speaks of him at least 43 times. In such names as Satan, the enemy, the adversary, the tempter, Beelzebub, prince of this world, a roaring lion, and so many more. And the devil, we know, was an angel that at one time was good, but was thrown out of heaven. And we see a, a variety of scriptures that talk about this. For example, in Isaiah chapter 14, uh, uh, verse 12 says, asks, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How you are cut down to the ground, you who weakened the nations. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I also will sit on the mount of the congregation. On the farthest sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol, to the lowest depths of the pit. We see very, very clearly that Satan wanted to take the place of God. And in turn, in the garden, isn't that what he told Adam and Eve? Eat of this, knowledge... Uh, fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, you'll become like God. He was telling them to do the very sin that he had done. And he knew exactly what would happen to them, didn't he? Because he said he's the enemy. He, he, he's not the friend that the devil went wrong. And, and we see very clearly that the, the devil, yes, does roam this world. In Job, we see whenever uh, he came and talked to God, which showed that God was still sovereign. It was like he was practically asking permission to do some things. And he said uh, he'd been going to, uh, f f here and there uh, to this place and that place, really uh, sowing havoc, like it's in this parable here, casting weeds into good uh, soil, into, into whatever soil he could. But we see here that the devil's goal is to do nothing but to alienate you from God. If he can alienate you from God, he alienates you from your family, from friends, from good works, from everything else in your life. Because you see, the devil's goal is to destroy us. The, the devil's goal is never good, for he's the enemy. Uh, and the demons of hell are under Satan's control. They seek to destroy God's servants. And I know a lot of movies have been made about that. The series of the, uh, uh, the Omen movies with uh, the Damien, who in some sense was a representative of Satan. And many other movies that I could mention that Hollywood has used to produce to tell us how Satan very clearly wants to destroy us. But even though he is the enemy, an enemy does not have to defeat us. See, he, the enemy is the devil. But we must realize that Jesus Christ defeated him on the cross. But he hasn't quite figured that out yet, has he? I had this reoccurring dream when I was a kid even into my adult years, for a number of years, that especially if I'd watch one of these, uh, you, you remember the old chiller movies with Wolfman, and those, those kind of, I would watch one, I'd get all scared, I'd go to sleep, and I'd dream that I was dropped into hell. And there I was, and the demons were all around me, the fire was all around me, and then Satan steps out, and you know, uh, being the, uh, not knowing exactly what Satan looked like, I uh, just saw him like normally people would see him. He, he had that red pajama suit, you know, and the tail and the horns and, and the mustache, you know, like that. And, uh, and he let me know very clearly he was going to kill me in that dream. But I remember what I was told that Jesus Christ could defeat any evil. And I reminded him in that dream that, that I was a child of God. He said, that doesn't matter. You're in hell now. And I thought about where Jesus descended into hell to defeat the devil. So I remember in that dream, it was, it was, and it's my dream, I can do whatever I want to in my dream. 
I grabbed his tail. And I started swinging him around, swinging him around, swinging around, and cast him into his own fire. And he burned. And I woke up and felt better. <laughs> it felt much better. I was pretty warm at that point, but I felt better. And, and I don't know why, why I was dreaming that over the years. I realize now, many years later, that there was this that Satan had with me of wanting to take my soul. He did not want me to go into the ministry. He did not want me to be used by God. If he could have won me then, many people would not have been won to Christ that I've been able to win to Christ. So the enemy is the devil. The second thing I would say is the devil sows uh, bad seeds into the, 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 har the harvest. These, these bad seeds, they turn into weeds. It tells us in uh, verse 25 and 26 that while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. And then you look down in verse 38, it says, The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. You see, in the early stages, wheat and tares look the same. It's hard to tell the difference. And it says here that the field is the world. That we're to live out our Christian lives day by day by day in the world. To be in the world, but not of the world. To not be like the world. Uh, but Jesus, obviously, went forth into the world to confront the world with war, hatred, the lack of truth, uh, a mad scramble for money and power, lust, selfishness. And a lot of times these get mixed with good. To say, well, you know, we can do these bad things for a good purpose. Well, you never do bad things for a good purpose. Uh, you do bad things, bad comes out of it. And, but Satan would tell you, you can mix all these together. You can mix the, the, the wheat and the tares. Well, let me ask you this. Would you get a half of glass of just fresh, cool water and mix it with a half a glass of swamp water? And say, well, it's, it's, half of it's good, so I'll just drink it. <laughs> no, you wouldn't. Of course you wouldn't. But Satan would tell you, it's okay. You've got good mixed in with that. He even uses the good things of God to try to get his way. Uh, we have to be careful. The church can easily have tares mixed in. We're human beings. We now have 83 churches in our association, by the way. And uh, praise the Lord for that. And, and, and you know something? Every church I go to, you know, I find human beings. <laughs> and you know, wherever you go, wherever I go, I'm still a human being. And I have to guard my heart. You have to guard your heart because sometimes Satan says, uh, cheap grace. Cheap grace. Jesus didn't really die on the cross for you, but I'll give you all the good things you need. Uh, sometimes we, we uh, look for social prestige over serving God. Or sometimes uh, the church becomes a hiding place from the world and we say, well, I don't want to deal with anything in the world. Sometimes that leads to a pious self-righteousness where uh, we, we can look and say, well, you know, I am the good one and everybody else is a bad one, so I, uh, I've got my ticket to heaven, so it doesn't matter. Sometimes the church can have these weeds sowed into it that when the church just becomes an institution and, and we just try to keep the institution alive. And survival becomes utmost in all of our goals so you see, we can, look how we can, in, whether you're in the world or in the church, you can mix the bad with the good. And when it's intermixed in all of us, we need forgiveness for these evil uh, seeds that Satan sows. For you see, sometimes we don't even realize how these things can grow in our lives. How, how Satan has planted a seed that's so subtle that we can't recognize it. I remember Charles Swindoll talked about a, a couple of sisters were traveling to Mexico on their way back. They saw what looked like a puppy over in the ditch. So they went over there and they picked it up and the lady said, oh, this is, this is a little chihuahua puppy. We need to take him, take care of him. So they took him home. They bathed him. They fed him. They even let him sleep with them. And then they took him over to the vet. And the vet said, where did you find this? They told him. 
he said, this is not a chihuahua. This is a, this is a rabid Mexican river rat. <laughs> Makes you shudder, doesn't it? That's worse than drinking swamp water. <laughs> in my book. <laughs> Sometimes we don't even realize that this has happened, do we? Until either somebody tells us or Satan shows us. Satan will eventually show you or something will come out to show you if you try to mix the bad with the good. There's a third point I want to share. Not only does he sow, but the third thing I would say is the devil sows secretly at night. The devil's not obvious. It tells us in verse 25 that. It said uh, that while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and then went his way. You see, Satan doesn't want to, you to recognize him. He will come in a variety of forms. Uh, he certainly, uh, I'm sure, did not look like Satan on the temptation on the mount, whenever Jesus was hungry and thirsty after 40 days and 40 nights in the wilderness, a time of testing. And Satan will come at you at your weakest point, and then he will trick you into thinking he is different than he really is. You see, God sows in the daytime for all to see. He is the daylight. He is the light of the world, Jesus is. He wants you to see every good work that he does, but Satan does not want you to see his works. He sows them secretly at night. And that kind of uh, sowing at night, once again, while we're asleep, it takes us by surprise. I remember uh, where I grew up in West Virginia, sometimes they would have these uh, traveling preachers come through with the tent revivals, and one was near Gilbert Creek, beside a creek, uh, and I remember we went there, and uh, preacher was preaching up a storm. He was uh, just, uh, I mean, he was jumping all over the place. He was really uh, moving along, but he stopped. And he very slowly walked down. There was an elderly lady that was right on the front row. And he walked very slowly like this. And he grabbed her cane. And he started to pull her cane, but she wouldn't let him have it. <laughs> so he grabbed it hard. And then he drew it back. I'm, what is he going to do? And he started hitting the ground. Then he took the crook on it and there was a three foot long copperhead <laughs> lying at her feet. And he walked back up. He held it up. He said, Satan is trying to destroy our revival and I killed the devil tonight. <laughs> That's the same way. Like that rabid Mexican river rat like a snake that crawls in under your chair I doubt if anybody heard anything the rest of that night they all looked under the chair the rest of the night <laughs> I know for me I got up out from uh, <laughs> out of my chair and got out of there to the back I was just a kid I didn't like snakes and never have but the devil here sows these things secretly at night while we're a spiritually asleep, or while we can't see him, he, he wants to harm us. There's a fourth thing I want to share. The devil tries to imitate God's wheat, as I've said several times. Verses 28 and 29, notice what he says. He said to them, an enemy has done this. The servant said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, uh, no. He said, no. Lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Once again, wheat and the tares look the same as they first start. And it takes a while for them to look separate, look different. It's like, it's like that phrase Jesus used, a wolf in sheep's clothing. I remember at, at Tamarack in Beckley where they have a lot of crafts. And one of them is a wooden, uh, hewn out of a piece of wood, a wolf with a sheepskin over it. And then there's a little wolf, which would be his son, with, sheep, <coughs> she, uh, with a sheep cloth over him. Sort of depicting, you know, that uh, children can become like their parents if they're, if they're not careful, the example that we have. That if they see Satan mixed in with us, they think it's okay. If we're a wolf in sheep's clothing, they'll become a wolf in sheep's clothing, most likely. That's why God says it's not just important for us, but for the example of the people who follow us. One of Satan's methods is to fight the kingdom of God through imitation. 
Imitation of Christian language. Imitation with, with holy ways of uh, uh, looking righteous. I remember uh, Jim Baker, remember, for many years. Then he fell from grace. Now he's back preaching again and, and, and has, seen, has saw the, the error of his ways. He wrote a book called I Was Wrong. Well, that's a great grasp of the obvious, I said when I saw that one. <laughs> You see, there are so many tests of a false prophet through the Bible, and if we don't read our scriptures and understand, Satan, Satan will even use false prophets that use godly words and godly language. We have to be so careful. That's why it's so important to have a pastor like Pastor Brian preach the word of God to you every week. Why is it important to come to church so you are able to join together as Christians because Satan is going to imitate God's wheat. He wants to destroy you. And you need to be with each other and you need to hear God's word and hear it and read it through the week and pray to God and have this relationship with God so that you can see what's happening. Uh, so many prophets in the Old Testament, for example, in Jeremiah. Uh, Jeremiah, he was a true prophet, but he prophesied about prophets that would just uh, would, would, would tell others, uh, kings or whoever, I have dreamed dreams when they didn't dream anything from God, it was just from themselves, and they would only say things to make the king and, and look good and then sound good, and, and then they would just copy each other. No, never a word from God. It is so essential and necessary to have a preacher who studies, who brings a sermon that God has given him before he brings it to the people, not just to go copy somebody else. But to say, this is what God has shown me. And I can tell you, folks, I've been in ministry about 37 years, and I have dealt with evil. I have dealt with sin. I have dealt with Satan. I've looked him in the face. And I know that he is out to destroy me and you. But I am, can perfectly be calm in telling you that Satan cannot defeat you. He, he cannot do it. No matter how much he imitates. Now, in, the Antichrist in Revelation chapter 13, in some sense will be like an imitation of God. Now there will be uh, a, a, really two beasts, one that come from the, the sea, which would be the, the political beast, and then one from the land, which would be the, um, the religious beast, and the religious beast would popularize through religion the political beast, and the two would sort of join together. Once again, intermixed religion and politics, to the point where not, now it's okay for Christianity to affect uh, uh, politics, to change that, to change morality, but it's not right whenever the two just became the, become the same. You can't even tell the difference between the two. And, and behind this we see is, is not, it's not the beasts that have the power. It's the dragon that has the power. And, and it, it tells us there uh, in, in Revelation chapter 13, verses 3 and 4, uh, going back to verse 2, the beast which I saw was like, and it, it describes a variety of different animals. And I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshipped, notice they didn't worship the beast, they worshipped the dragon, who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped then the beast, saying, Who is like the beast, who is able to make war with him? In some sense saying, no one can defeat this beast. He has the power of the dragon, of Satan behind him. Now we know how it all ends. How it's prophesied to end. That the day of Armageddon will come whenever evil is running rampant. Whenever uh, evil has come in and intermixed with good and, and you don't, don't know the difference. There will still be those written in the Lamb's Book of Life. And it's said to be patient. To wait. Allow God to work. But in the end, Jesus will come back. It depicts him symbolically on a white horse. That being a purity really is what that, and power. And here are all the armies of the world. Now get this, not only all the armies of the world now, but really when you look at this closely, it's all the armies of the world of the past all the way up to the present. Joined together on the field of Armageddon, and they're going to come to fight God. And Jesus comes, and with one word, we don't even know what it was. He used no weapon other than the power of his word, one word, and wiped all of them out. 
And blood flowed, the scripture tells us, for miles. And when you look at it more closely, when you look at really what it's talking about, you're talking blood flowing about two feet thick, deep, for miles. Because there is nothing that can defeat God. And in the end, that's what's going to happen. Because the, the, the truth of the word of God will stand. And that leads to the last point. Final point, that the devil's weeds will be separated from God's wheat at the last judgment. The devil's weeds will be separated from God's wheat. Verse 30 tells us very clearly. It has some other verses there, but look in particular at verse uh, 30. Let both of them grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, first gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now we see that over in Matthew chapter 25, the sheep and the goats. That one day God will separate. And really the, the, the defining factor of who is going to go on one side and who is going to go on the other side is the grace of Jesus Christ. Who has accepted Jesus Christ as personal Savior and Lord? Uh, n- nothing that they've earned or deserve or are worthy. Only the Lamb is worthy to be praised. Is what the Bible tells us. This is a parable for people who are impatient with evil. And that's one of the questions you ask so many times, sometimes by people who don't believe in God. They say, but what about evil? Well, Jesus, Jesus here would recognize, yes, there is evil. We live in a fallen world. And as he did in Job's days, he does in our day, he goes here and there, trying to sow discord and harm God's people any way he can. But someday the separation of good and evil will come in God's name, in God's time, and in God's way. The last opportunity to, for repentance has not run out. I don't know how long it will be. I don't know when Jesus will come back. I'm not one of these date setters uh, that writes books on it, and then they rewrite the book when it doesn't happen. <laughs> then they rewrite it a second and third time when it doesn't happen, and duh, you think people would figure it out after a while, wouldn't you? Even Jesus said, not even the Son of Man knows the knows uh, the timing, really, the day or the hour, the, the year, any time. Only God the Father knows. But God is patient. He is wanting to give people time to repent. He is wanting to give us time to witness to people because Satan is destroying lives. And people are accepting Satan when they are not witness to and don't know an alternative. And if you turn away from God, the only alternative, alternative is to accept Satan. No God, only Satan. He made it very clear there is no in-between point here. You know, we must, even to the last moment, have this urgency. It's been three years ago uh, this October that uh, my 43-year-old sister passed away, uh, Tammy. And we only found out just maybe a couple of months before that that she had cancer. And uh, she and I were talking on the phone. And she had not accepted Christ. I would told her about Christ before. But she had kind of just pushed it off. I mean, you know, uh, still young, had plenty of time. One day I remember she called me and we were, I called her and we were talking. She said, uh, she, said uh, she called me Ronnie. She said, Ronnie, who could I talk to to tell me about how to be saved? And here I told her several times. <laughs> you know how it is with family. You know, you got to go out and get an expert somewhere else. <laughs> I reminded her, even though I was her brother, I was still a preacher. And I told her about Jesus dying on the cross for our sins, defeating, defeating Satan, defeating all sickness, and one day we will have all tears wiped from our eyes. One day we will be in heaven because she knew she was not going to make it. She was in hospice. She knew it was very unlikely. And then she, she accepted the Lord, and then she said, if I had known this was how to accept the Lord, I would have done it years ago. Well, she did know intellectually, but she didn't know in her heart. Somewhere Satan had put that block telling her she had more time. That she could wait as long as she wanted to. Well, I remember uh, having the day of the funeral. 
my cousin Sharon sang a song, and as she was singing, and I was just sitting behind uh, the pulpit there, I was praying, just getting ready to preach. It was a big pulpit. You could hardly see it, and I was, had my head down. And uh, I heard somebody drop at my feet. And it was my nephew, Michael. Michael, big, muscular kind of guy. As big as I am, he could pick me up and throw me across the room. Tough guy, strong. He was weeping like a baby. And he asked, he said, uh, he said, Uncle Ronnie, he said, I'm, I'm lost. I need to know how to be saved. He said, I said, Tammy was saved, and I can be saved too, can I? I said, and I asked him, I said, do you trust me, Michael? He said, yes. I said, well, I can tell you, you can trust Jesus. And I led him through the sinner's prayer right there. As I was getting ready to preach my sister's funeral, led my nephew to Christ behind that pulpit. You never know when or how or where someone can be saved. Don't ever miss an opportunity to take away someone from Satan and give them to God. Amen. Overcome evil with good, not by sowing evil. Overcome evil by sharing God's grace. Realize no matter who you are, no matter what your background is, no matter how old we become, we are, no matter what we've done, we always have the opportunity for God's saving grace. You've heard of Devil Lance Hatfield. He uh, lived just across the hill of Horsepen Mountain where I grew up. I remember my grandmother used to tell me about going over and seeing Devil Lance. She saw him whenever she was a little girl. He was a Christian at that point. But mo most of his life, a large majority, he was not. And it was said that at some point there was a preacher in the area who led him to Christ. And he was, uh, a very, he was aged at the time. And it was said that they took, uh, I always called him Uncle Lance. I never knew he was famous until I grew up. And they said that, and my grandmother will tell you, said they took Uncle Lance out to Island Creek there to baptize him. And when he came up, the story goes that for three days, people would not use the water in Island Creek because they wanted to wait till all of his sins washed down. <laughs> It's, and they did. They all washed down, washed by the blood of Jesus Christ. Amen. His statue still stands up there, and I've got pictures of it. I've seen it. I wish I could have met him in his latter years. You know, he didn't call himself Devil Lance. That's what other people called him earlier on. It's too bad that they couldn't have changed that name after he became a Christian. Doesn't matter, though. His name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So I say today, you know, yeah, Halloween is upon us. Realize, yeah, you can have fun just like any holiday. I mean, you can make Christmas bad if you celebrate it incorrectly. But always put Jesus at the center of everything, and you won't go wrong. Always look to Jesus as your light. He will shine into your darkness. And when Satan comes to get you, Tell him just like Jesus did. Get behind me. Get behind me, Satan. Go away, and he will. Let me pray for you. Oh, Lord, there's so much that we have to face in this world today, and evil is still rampant. I'm seeing it just incrementally growing, evil spreading. But so is your word. Just like I'm seeing churches planted here through this association, the, the best way to kill out weeds, someone told me, is to plant more grass. So I'm just here to plant more of God's grace and His goodness, the hope that we have only in Jesus Christ. May we firmly grasp Jesus' hand. May we let Him come into our hearts, knowing that He will protect us from the evil one and that he will be there to help us every step of the way. In Jesus' name, amen. The invitation always is for, in particular, if you don't know Christ, you are at the mercy of Satan. He will defeat you. Ultimately, he will. Only Christ can defeat him. If you're a Christian today, realize today that uh, you're a child of God, that uh, 
God, Satan and no one else, nothing can, can take you out of God's hands. You may be here today as a Christian and, and looking at a variety of ways that God's speaking to you to serve him you know, through this church and through your, in your life, in your day-to-day world, how, where to witness. You know, God is always wanting us to plant good seeds. Make sure you plant those good seeds. We're going to have a time of invitation now, and if uh, you have a decision you want to make, I'll be here to pray with you.